Hello everyone. I hope you're having a great time at the conference. I'd like to thank the organizers of the conference, in particular Dr. Rahshani, for inviting me to give this keynote. In this brief keynote today, um, I'll be just talking about um, the newly developed field of cultural linguistics, its theoretical framework, its analytical framework, and I'll just give a couple of examples from Persian. <coughs> cultural linguistics is a multidisciplinary area of research that explores the relationship between language and cultural conceptualizations. Um, cultural linguistics examines features of human languages or language varieties that encode culturally constructed conceptualizations of a whole range of human experience. Um, for cultural linguistics, languages are archives or repositories of cultural conceptualizations, both in the past and present. This diagram summarizes the theoretical framework of cultural linguistics and its analytical framework. The theoretical framework um, defines and explains the relationship between language, cultural conceptualizations, and cultural cognition, which is the broad notion that encompasses language and cultural conceptualizations. The analytical framework, on the other hand, um, explains what cultural categories are, cultural metaphors are, cultural schemas, and how they are encoded in human languages. So we use the analytical framework of cultural linguistics to examine features of human languages that encode cultural categories, cultural metaphors, and cultural schemas. In my work on Aboriginal English, on Persian, I have provided um, lots of examples um, of how Persian um, encodes underlying cultural conceptualizations. I have given examples from Tarof, Adab, um, from emotions, and I'll be talking about one of the emotions here today. Sharmandegi, um, Shekastanafsi. Um, but today, um, I'll be just giving a couple of examples, one emotion and one body part. This is the framework that I have recently developed in my new book for studying emotions across languages. I have talked about different layers, starting with the experience of feelings and then we categorize these feelings into different emotions. We use certain metaphors, we use cross-domain conceptualizations, for example, heart as the seat of emotion. Then we schematize emotions, we associate emotions with particular cultural values, with religion, with gender, and eventually these emotions, we express and encode them in human languages. In some languages, the expression of emotion is more intense. For example, we know in funerals in Iran, um, expressions of sadness are very intense compared to uh, the Western world. So the example that I have chosen is from my recent work uh, on the cultural emotion category of Qam. To begin with, there is no one particular cultural category in English for Qam. Qam overlaps with at least five different emotion categories in English, with worry, sadness, pain, grief, and sorrow. All of these English emotion categories overlap with Qam. 
Orkam, uh, Orkam Orkose, really captures a whole range of emotional states. From being hurt with what someone has said, to being away from relatives, worrying about children, suffering from the pain of love, to having lost a beloved and having financial difficulties. So a whole range of human um, emotions um, are expressed through Ram. So that was the emotion category of Ram. Now we come to cross-domain conceptualization or what we call cultural metaphors. We use particular cultural metaphors to talk about Ram. The main one is sadness is eating Ram or Ram Khordan. We say Ram Nahor. Um, basically, as if Ram is um, an object or something and we, we eat it. We even say Ram Konja Delam um, Lune Karde. So it's as if, you know, Ram is a kind of bird or animal that occupies a nest in the corner of the heart. So all of this shows that it's as if really Ram is, is an edible entity that we eat and it goes and piles up, you know, in, in our heart. And of course, in this one, there is also another um, cultural metaphor, and that's heart or del as the seat of emotion. Of course, I'm aware that del could also mean abdomen. Uh, physically. Yes, we say Ram konj delam talambar shude or ambar shude. It's as if, you know, Ram um, is an edible entity. In terms of cultural schema of Ram, um, I think, you know, um, if, if you compare male with female, I think we agree that Ram is uh, more associated with uh, women than females. For example, Ram Khare Madar. Or, as you can see in this um, photo, Madar is called Sultan Ram Madar. So when we associate Ram with particular gender, with uh, members of the family, you know, usually parents, um, they eat Ram for children. Um, also, um, in a study that one of my PhD students uh, is conducting on sadness in Persian, a lot of speakers associate Ram with relig religion. Um, so all of these are cultural schemas that people more or less share about Ram. Good and good two um, medical anthropologists years ago went to Iran, and this is what they say. Ramagosse poses special problems of understanding for the psychological anthropologist or for the student of Iranian society and culture. They have dramatically different meanings and forms of expression in Iranian culture than in our own. A rich vocabulary of Persian and Azeri, terms of grief and sadness translate uneasily into English language and American culture. And they say Ramagosse is rather a core effect core effect, sorry, the central emotion of religious ritual, an important element of the definition of selfhood, a key quality of a developed and a profound understanding of the social order. So you can see that foreigners also understand that Ramo Rosé is quite different in Persian than in Western varieties of English. So that was about cultural categories, cultural 
metaphors and cultural schemas associated with Qam. It was a very brief one. Um, I have presented a bit more examples in my uh, new monograph. Um, I have also studied um, the concept of del. Del in Persian is associated with many, many things. Of course, physiologically, we say del, such as delam dar mikone, it refers to abdomen. But figuratively, it refers to the heart when we say delam bara ki tang shode. Um, del, there are examples that I have given in my book that shows that del uh, or, or profiles del as the seat of emotions, feelings and desires, del ambassani um, michot, del as the seat of thoughts and memories, harfike mizanam to delet bezar be kesinagu, del as the center of personality traits, character, adame. Um, character and mood, um, um, this is an example where um, center of desires, feelings, and emotions, as delam birun raft, as del birun raftan, falling out of favor. Or falling into favor. Um, del is the seat of compassion and mercy. Del is the seat of sympathy. Del is also the agent for desires and cravings. Del a fancy new house. As I said, del is also conceptualized as the center of thoughts and emotions. Raza del, delish sare zabunishe. Chizi ke mikham behet began to delet bezar be kesi nagu. It is the place for secrets. As I said, it is also conceptualized as the center of personality traits, character, and mood. Delam op should. Del as the seat of patience. Del and um, is this also seat of courage and bravery. Reza Khedi Derojigardare is very brave. Del Badar Yazadan, to risk. Del is also used in narrative on illness and anxiety. Del shure dashtan, turbulence in, in, in the del. Del to del amnist, I'm sort of anxious. We have a large number of um, Persian poems and in general Persian literature um, about Del, in which Del has been used. The most famous one probably that comes to mind is Baba Tahir's Megar Shiro Pelangi e Del e Del, Bemo Daim Bejangi e Del e Del. So these are in summary conceptualizations of Del in Persian. As I said, I have used also cultural linguistics, the analytical framework, to, ta to explore Aberu, Taruf, Rudarbaisti, Shekastanafsi, Sharmandegi, Rudarbaisti was the subject of the thesis by one of my former PhD students. Yeah, Taruf you know, making requests, offering goods and services, invitations, apology. Taruf underlies a lot of um, speech acts in Persian. So that's about it. Um, now cultural linguistics is quite well established. It's got a handbook. It's got a, an international journal of language and culture, which I'm editing. 
Um, it's got a new book series with Springer um, in which the first volume was recently published, Advances in Cultural Linguistics. It's uh, 800 pages. This is the table of content of uh, in what languages and which areas cultural linguistics has been used in various areas, in various languages. I think in, I accounted for more than 40 languages studies have been done. And this is my new uh, book. Um, there is a website where we have put a lot of resources for cultural linguistics. So I hope, and, and of course the relevance of cultural linguistics to language teaching is that it shows that um, we think for every Persian word there is a word in English. That's the assumption in many cases in language teaching. What I'm saying here and what I'm trying to show is that no, that's not the case. We don't have one to one. We don't have a word in English for Taruf, and that's why in American English now they use Taruf to refer to Iranian, um, uh, what they call courtesy. Um, so it's relevant to language teaching, intercultural communication, world Englishes, political discourse. So I have tried to show, particularly teaching English as an international language, I have tried to show uh, the relevance of cultural linguistics to applied areas such as the one that I mentioned. I hope you find it useful and I'm very much looking forward to see Iranian scholars um, becoming interested and, and conducting more and more research in cultural linguistics. Thank you very much for listening.